Today, we explore a complicated but interesting rifle life cycle. We discuss monopods, markings, and mums with a special guest, and get into market trends, trivia, and spin the wheel of Millsurf, all on this jam-packed episode about our Millsurf of the show, the primary firearm of the Japanese infantry in World War II, the Type 99 Arasaka Short Rifle. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Tom. Howdy, hey everyone. I'm co-host Kelly. And today's Millsurf of the show, of course, is the primary infantry rifle of the Imperial Japanese Army during World War II. And also the number one GI bringback foreign rifle of World War II, the Type 99 Arasaka short rifle. Do you know, do you know anyone with a bringback paper rifle? I have seen them posted, but I don't know anyone myself. I've seen them posted on forums and things like that, so they are out there. I've seen one in person and just hear a lot of stories, but one day maybe. I love this rifle because not only is it uh, such a great design with all these interesting, crazy little features, but the variations over the life cycle, you could spend like nine years researching and trying to get every single one. Oh, yeah, there's so many little changes here and there, and this part was removed, that part was removed. You, like, look at the Mosins and, like, the 9130s. Did they change at all? Not not nearly as something like this. K98s have a bit of variation like the Type 99s do, but the Type 99s definitely take the top spot for that. So these were nice when they started out and they left the arsenal originally, the early ones. They were 43 inches long with 28-inch barrels and about 9 pounds. So they were about the same as Car 98s and almost like the same as a Grand. So they're pretty much on par, right, with everything else? Yeah, they're not anything significantly different from what other countries were issuing at the time in terms of size and weight. We've both shot them, so the balance, they're very nice rifles. I like them. I think they shoot beautifully. They're one of my favorites to take to the range. So chambered in 7.7 by 58, which is kind of a hard to get cartridge nowadays, but yeah, it's a reloader only cartridge for the most part. I I know a number of people who've gotten into reloading just to do the 7.7. Oh yeah, I'm certain glad I do. Oh, so you do do it, right? Oh, I, yes, I make my own. I did find some ammo commercially, but I've made my own for the most part. Is there a big surplus of 7.7 around? The only surplus 7.7 you'll find, and pe- people get bit by this, is the machine gun ammo that you mentioned earlier with the, oh. the rim on it. Right. And people buy it thinking it's regular 7.7, then you can't use it in your Type 99. And you probably get a lot because it was for a machine gun. Oh, yeah. There, you can find, like, unopened crates of it, but it's almost worthless because you can't shoot anything with it. Oh, well. That's sad. Like, 8 millimeter Mauser, there's so many different variations in countries. And another reason Mauser's better, I'm just saying, in general. So, <laughs> so these were five rounds, stripper clips, just like Mausers. The locking lugs were like Mausers. Except the, these were cock on clothes. Now, I'm torn on that. I kind of like it. That cock on open always seems a little less smooth to work the action. Cock and clothes, you're already pushing that bolt forward. So. Well, the rest of the gun was the Type 38, pretty much, with the same kind of bolt handles, the safeties, the the knurled flower. They call that the knurled flower, I guess, safety. Yeah, the intricate design. And the dust cover, which was the, from the 38, but the monopod and the AA sights are the two big ones that stand out. Definitely. So the rest of the gun was nice. They had front sight ears. Um, the same two-piece stocks that they like to use to save on their resources. So with the early ones, now they're called early, but the, as they left the factory originally, they were beautiful, full, complete. And now, could you tell us the transitions and all this other shit that happened afterwards that led to the final ones, which we'll get to, which are what gives them their bad reputation? Well, yeah, so we've only been talking about the, the Cadillac of Type 99, the early ones, as they're called now. So the Japanese were getting hit pretty hard, and starting around 1943, maybe late 1942, it's kind of up for debate. There's not a lot of records on it. That's when the manufacturers began starting to 
cut some parts or not include this, not include that to conserve materials for the war effort. So any parts they deemed unnecessary, they began leaving them off to save the metal and machine time and things like that. So starting in 1943 is when you'll find what they're known as the transition models. And these are the ones where they're still pretty high quality rifles. They're still really nice finish and everything like that on the metal. But they start leaving off some features, some things like the monopod and the AA or anti-aircraft sight arms on the rear side there. Some of them will have it where they were issued with the attachment points for the monopod or the rear side or the anti-aircraft sight arms, but they just didn't put them on. And those, you can kind of tell for the monopod piece, there'll be a little gouge in the wood where the monopod was if it had it and some scratches towards the front of the barrel where you kind of clamp on. And that, so, they just clamped on by friction? Yeah, the, the monopod was kind of shaped to where it would clamp around the tail, the front end of the wood. So it's kind of a spring that clipped over it. So you can see on the earlier models where they have scratches on them or like a little ding in the wood. And that's how you know it originally had a monopod. Whereas with these transitional models right around mid-war time, they might have a mounting point for a monopod, but no scratches, no indica- indication that it ever had one. And there's there's a lot of nuance to this because there, there was, what, like the seven or eight different manufacturers, and they each started doing this at different times and depending on where the materials were sourced and things like that. So there's a lot of, you can really dig into some of these things like, the oh, this series from this manufacturer should have this, this feature during this time and things like that. I heard that during the transitions, some were making full early feature rifles while others were like seven transitions in already. Oh, yeah. Some of them were already onto the rough cut metal and things like that, where when some of them were still making the nice finish and may or may not still have AA sights and the monopod and all that good stuff. That seems to be one of the reasons the Type 99 ads are very specific, because you can't just say early Type 99 or you have to list out the series and the year, the features. Yeah, that can that can be a, if you know what you're looking for, that can be a good way to get a good deal on something if you're looking for one of the less common ones and they're just like, oh, it's just uh, such and such, it's just a Type 99, just a regular old one, but it can be something special if you actually know what you're looking at. So for things they were removing, they removed the monopod and AA sights, sight arms first. And then once they removed those, they didn't really have a need for the mounting points for them. So they removed the mounting point on the barrel band for the monopod and simplified the rear sight to not have little joints for where you can put the AA arms. And right around this time, this is probably, um, this is a very broad generalization, but late 1943, early 1944 is when they really started doing kind of the rougher machine, machining marks maybe changing up the style of bolt handle from the nice plum shape that we've seen on the earlier ones to the kind of more cylindrical shape on the later ones, colloquially. That's a lot of obvious stuff now. Oh, yeah. Now we're getting into where you you just you can look at it and be like, oh, that's a transitional, or oh, that's an early, oh, that's a late. And ugly stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, and don't forget the, the rear safety, that beautiful rear safety you just mentioned once they started getting into the harder times. Now it's just, they just... Slap it on there and put a big old weld on the rear to hold it on. No more fine machining work for the flower pattern on the rear with the safety. It really does look like they just rushed it out. As soon yep. as that part was done, it was thrown out of the door. Oh, yeah, get rid of all of the finesse to it. But they're still perfectly fine rifles to shoot. They shoot great. They handle well. I mean, I think they're still some of the best rifles of the war for bolt-action rifles, at least, even during the transition phase. And then once we kind of get into the Late war, late 1944, 1945. That's when you really start to see the like super rough machining on them, poor finish, bolts really roughly made. And now they're getting rid of the complicated adjustable rear sight where it's just now it's just a rear sight welded, rear peep sight welded onto the receiver. They got rid of the front sight protector ears. The barrel bands were simplified, and they're just held on by screws or just pinned on. And then they even... It looks they, homemade at this point. Oh, yeah. They're, they they look pretty rough. They got the One of the easy ways to tell is the butt plate. They had a nice, thick metal butt plate all the way up until now, and now they have just a 
a wooden butt plate nailed onto the rear, which really you don't want to you don't want to have a rifle because you guarantee you'll crack your stock at some point, slam it into the ground. But of all the things, at- that's the one I use to say a last ditch. If the butt plate's wooden, that's it. Oh, yeah. Now this this is where the the, the term last ditch really comes into play for like the. All right, this is late 1945. They're getting their butts kicked. We're almost to Japan. They need rifles yesterday. So that anything that can get out the door and send a bullet towards an enemy, it's going out the door. And that's kind of why people kind of have seen for a long time the Type 99 is like, oh, they're it's just cheap Japanese junk. They're not good. They're not good rifles. They're they're crap, crappily made. You see one of these late war last ditch rifles. You'll probably agree with them, but man, this is this is what they're using. This was it what they're issuing to their soldiers. This is rough, but in reality, it it makes sense given the situation that they're in. But if you compare a, a late war rifle to an early war rifle, it's a whole world of difference. They're they're not completely different rifles, but man, there's there's a, there's a lot of features that they did away with, a lot of corner cutting that they did on these. And I heard but, they chrome lined the bores until forty five. And yep. maybe the very last ones they didn't. Yeah, they chrome line them up, as far as I know, just about all the way up until the end. And we didn't mention it really, but the mum, which is the royal emperor's uh, marking that's on official items and rifles and guns, um, there's actually a, a premium for a mum. Yeah, that's a seems to be a thing in the collector world is mum or no mum, and a lot of people kind of debate that. So I guess the story behind all these is it marked it as emperor's, pro- the property of the emperor on all these guns, so it was a disgrace to the emperor to hand over a piece of property with this symbol on it. So there was, it seemed it seemed to be on such like an industrial scale that it must have been organized some in some way where they would deface They're them. They're all done or, so differently. It's so yeah. odd. They're either like hit with a hammer, hit with a rock, ground off carefully and polished, done with a chainsaw. Chainsaw. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of variation in the way they remove these these symbols. And it is interesting, but it's there's so many rifles out there with them removed. It must have been on some sort of an industrial organized scale. So that is there is <clears throat> definitely a premium for rifles that have this mum completely untouched. So you'll see. Intact mum or ground mum on the on an ad for Type ninety nine. So if you want like a complete original one, intact mum is going to be your go to. If you don't particularly care, you want or the you, mum. yeah, you definitely want the mum. Or if I, I mean personally, I think it's kind of interesting history as well. You can kind of point to it and like, oh, this used to have a symbol, but they removed it, kind of thing. I think it's interesting in and of itself that it was removed. So I don't really. Right, so maybe the best of both worlds is you get one that's partially removed. Yeah, there you go. That way you can see what it looked like and also hey. tell the story of like, hey, this is what happened and this is why. Right. But the premium of the mum kind of comes from like, oh, this was a this was a capture rifle. Whereas if the mum was removed, you know it was surrendered to somebody and then it could have been just picked up out of a pile of some GI that just got off the boat and be like, hey, if you want a rifle, run over there and grab one before you leave. Right, that lore must have been going a long time. Yeah, it must have passed down through the generations at this point. <laughs> yes. But if you want the mum, you can wait for it. You you can get it. One will be available. And it's not a huge premium it seems like. So no, it's not it's it's not double the money or anything. Yeah, it's just a little bit more overall. Just and it depend there's again, there's such variations to all this. It all really depends on what you're what you're looking at. I mean, if the rifle's in pristine shape and the mum's missing, that would kind of bother me. Yeah, it, it it would be nice to have one with all the features, all matching, all original, and a mum. That's like the that's the Cadillac right there of Type 99s. Yeah, there's there's a market out there for every facet of the Arasaka stages because I saw a guy who had seven last stitches, and then I saw a guy the other day who had like. Seven, seven series rifles, you know, like. Oh yeah, there's collectors for any of them. Some people want an example of each. Some people only want pristine. Or some people want all the late boards and all the different features and things like that. That's one of the things that makes Type 99s really collectible compared to some other rifles. 
You know, there's just so many transitions. It's maddening. I, I, it's hard to deal with it. Yeah, there's a ton of like nuances and changes and everything. So to help us out, we brought in an outside expert. Yes, we did. There were 3 million Type 99s made out there, so there's a lot to sort through. And throwing also, it's the most complicated life cycle of any Milsurp rifle I could think of. Things can get a bit tricky when trying to assess these rifles. So today, we have a special guest to help us figure it all out. If you've spent any time at all researching a Type 99, you've run across his site, Conrad from Type99Arasakas.Weebly.com. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. So, Conrad, your site, I've run across your site numerous times, even on accident where I'm just browsing the images of Google. Well, that's, I like to hear that because I like to know it's actually something that is <laughs> in Google. I always wonder if it's actually something people run across or not when they're just like <laughs> typing in type 99. Yes, especially with uh, your extensive photos. And uh, are those all your rifles? So it's kind of crazy. I, I, I would guess like 80 to 85% of the rifles on that site are from me. Anything with the wagon wheel, you'll know that's mine. <laughs> yep. Okay, yeah, when we were looking up pics, I saw a good amount of wagon wheel pics. I'm like, oh, I recognize that background. Yeah, that's, there's a few, it's obviously, I mean, just like you just said, the amount of variations of the 99 is pretty crazy, so I can't have them all. So there are some folks, a lot of Japanese collectors I know that have helped contribute some uh, some of the harder to find variants onto the site that I don't have. So I appreciate them for that. So I always credit them on the site, but most of that on there, if it's got a wagon wheel, that's something in my personal collection. Wow. So how many would you say you have total? <laughs> do you know? I would Some say, folks don't know. You have too many. You just don't even know. I, <laughs> I do have too many. I probably, I, in total in Arasaka's, I probably got like 90 or so. Ooh, right. <laughs> and that's that's between the 38s and the 99s and the and the type 30s and all that stuff. So it's, it's kind of crazy how that like, happened. Now that's a pattern collector. <laughs> Yeah, I got like 12 of this gun. I'm like, oh, God, I've got 90, and what am I doing? That's uh, a lot more than I thought. <laughs> well, and it, the the crazy thing is that's over the course of maybe like seven years. I, I feel like it's been like seven or eight years I've been collecting Japanese rifles. It might be a little bit less than that, but back when I started, the prices were pretty good, and so I picked up a ton of stuff back then, and I'm pretty glad I did because I would not – if I started doing this two years ago, I would not have this many. Trust me. All right. You seem like the right guy then because we, we were talking about it and saying, let's let's talk about how to get the right gun, how to get a good one. How do you know if it's matching, if it's proper, if it's original? And, and there's – You'll know. And there's a lot to it because uh, every manufacturer, there there was a bunch of them that made them. And – they all, every one of them did stuff a little bit differently. So sometimes you'll have a rifle that you think is matching and, and it's not, you know, or, or, or do you think it's mismatched and it's actually not mismatched? It's got assembly number parts on it, stuff like that, even with the 99. So it can get pretty wild. All right. So I, I just put up the chart here of the, the eight different manufacturers and the chaos that is these the, series numbers that were given out. Yes. <laughs> Uh, do you have any idea why this is the method that they they use? First of so, all, so the series starts with when they when they started production, especially with the Type Thirty Eights. Um, with the Thirties and the Thirty Fives, they did not the, the serial numbers don't go that high, like relative. But with the Thirty Eights, they started getting into almost like you know the the hundreds of thousands. You know, it was going into the millions, and uh, but that was, was so getting, nice for a collector to just be able to look at the serial. <laughs> To, to look at it and just know that was in sequential order. Yeah. Yes. 38s, the early 38s, what they call the no series, like Tokyo made rifles that, you know, started when they began production into the 20s when the, the earthquake happened. But those ones just go in sequential order of the, seri uh, the serial number. And what was happening was that the numbers were getting so high and they were literally hand stamping those serial numbers. Like, you know, each, each individual number was getting a stamp and it was just getting to the point where it was, kind of difficult to just number a rifle that was like that long wait so you know they used to say those were fake a lot of people used to say fake serial numbers because they were all crooked but that was you said they it did individual numbers yeah so yep so uh, and wow. you'll see that the 99s i've seen uh examples where numbers are overstamped 
And uh, they're not, you know, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't say everyone isn't fake, obviously. There are fake 99 restamp numbers out there. But the Japanese did have errors where they would accidentally stamp the wrong number and just, you know, maybe it was a Friday. And they wanted to get out of there. So they stamped, you know, <laughs> over a two, they stamped the three. And then they just went about their day. Uh, so, yeah, they were hand stamping even with the 99s and everything. They were hand stamped because you'll find one of the things I always find interesting is uh, the series markings. Sometimes you'll see those canted, like crooked because somebody was just stamping it the wrong way that for that little bit of time. So yeah, all those numbers were hand stamped and it was just getting to the point where it was just so difficult. And that's why they started using the series markings with the 38s after they reset up operations at uh, Kokura and Nagoya in the thirties. So those rifles are the first ones that have like the series markings. And then obviously when they developed the 99, they kept that going. And then, then like you just said, the 99s, they made millions of them. So especially like, you know, Nagoya made literally millions of them and it would have been a pain in the butt to, to mark those individually, like stamping them like that. So that's kind of where that originates from the idea to, to use a series marking to do that. And then each group is a a hundred thousand rifles, right? Each. Yep. And it starts with, to make it clear, it starts with serial number zero. Zero is the first one they did. I was actually, in anticipation of doing this, I pulled out some old articles from uh, a uh, collector's kind of publication I subscribe to called Bonsai. And uh, it's just articles written by literally just folks like me, you know, that collect the rifles. But a guy had an example of a rifle, a Type 99 6 Series, that was serial number zero. So they literally <laughs> start, they started from zero and went to... 99,099 to uh to get to 100,000 rifles. Oh, that's a cool one to have. It's the only one that I know of that starts with serial number zero like that. So they started from zero all the way to uh, uh 99,999. I was going to say to add to more confusion, they gave out all these series numbers all at once. So a series yeah. zero and a series 20 Kukura are, the, are both early. Yep, they're both early, and there's no, as far as I'm aware, I've never seen any research that suggests why each arsenal was given the the series marks they were. Uh, there, there's nothing to it to explain why, you know, like Nagoya was given zero through whatever, and then Kokura had 20. Um, there's no information on that. They were just kind of, I guess, arbitrarily assigned that based on what was available. Okay, that was going to be my question. Is like, how do they know? Like, okay, Nagoya, you're only going to get zero through nineteen, and yeah, it's, well, what if they made too many, or they made two million, or something like that, and they ran out of series? It's kind of interesting. That was one of the problems they ran into with Type Thirty Eight when they first started production again after uh, the earthquake at Tokyo that took out the Tokyo arsenal. Uh, Kokura actually just started up production right where uh, Tokyo left off, like in the two million serial range. And uh, the problem was that they overlapped a bunch of serial numbers. Um, and and use the same manufacturer mark too, right? Use the, the same, yep. Cannonballs. That's a big one uh, a lot of folks get confused with is how to identify like a Tokyo rifle from a Kokura rifle. And there is a slight, um, especially with the 99s, there's a slight difference in the style. It's very slight, but uh, the, the biggest way is obviously the, the Tokyo era guns don't have any series number at all. So if you have a series number on your like type 30, I know we're not talking about 38s, but if you have a series number on your 38, it's not a, it's not a Tokyo gun. Uh, that'll be a Kokura gun for sure. Oh, I like information like that. Quick, yeah. And small and easy to remember. Um, I was curious if any of the manufacturers are better than any others, like maybe towards the end, did someone take less shortcuts? Yeah. So <laughs> that it's worth so it. They all. When it comes down to it at the end, they all end up doing the shortcuts for the most part, the the arsenals that made guns right until the end of the war. But I think when it comes to the overall quality, I think Toyo Kogyo, uh, the 35th series, even though those are all late war guns, I think they have a better, the ones I've handled and owned over the years, they have a better bluing and the stock finish is just nicer overall. So I, and I think the early, the early Toyo Kogyo guns are some of the nicest Type 99s. The bluing on the, the, the long rifles for Toyo Kogyo, they did uh, another confusing thing is they the long rifles that are, you know, before even any of these short right. rifles, made, they use the 35th series, even though the 35th yeah. series, the short 99, <laughs> like the latest late gun, you know, fixed sight and all that. So it's kind of interesting. But yeah, they're early. 
uh, long rifles and the early short rifles are just like commercial quality bluing. And it's just, they're beautiful guns. So I, I would say out of all the arsenals, they were the one that made the, uh, the nicest ones consistently. Wow. So they were, uh, a commercial factory, right? Um, so they, they were technically subcontracted because they have the Kokura logo next to the little, uh, the little symbol, their little circle symbol there. So they were technically a sub, a, a subcontractor of, uh, Kokura. But you can see with the production, they, they, they made just as many as Kokura. That's what's interesting. A lot of folks, and it's, it's nothing that's confirmed. It's just kind of based off some stuff, but a lot of people think that Kokura may have ended up stopping, uh, their production before the end of the war. So even though the chart there says like, you know, it goes 25th series goes to the end of the war. Some folks think that, that cause Kokura was big with, they made artillery pieces and a lot of other stuff. Like they weren't just a small arms, you know, factory. Um, and there's some evidence to suggest that maybe Kokura might've stopped production even earlier before the war even ended. They may have stopped 99 production to focus on like other, other facets of the war essentially. Um, because Kokura is one of the only arsenals besides uh, Toyo Kogyo that doesn't have a, a receiver that doesn't have dust cover grooves at the very end. Some All those other arsenals, for the most part, switch to receivers that actually don't even have dust cover grooves. But Kokura never really did that for the most part, which kind of suggests that maybe they stopped earlier on before they even got to that point. It, it's difficult, especially with the literally almost the other lack of of primary documentation giving dates or change like there's no there's no known you know documents to say okay we're going to switch over to this style of rear site now you know all arsenals need to start switching to this fixed site there's no decrees or anything like that that exists uh everything was just destroyed by the japanese and from just you know obviously the 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 strategic bombing of japan at the time uh, and even post-war, the Japanese did a really good job of just destroying these documents before the occupation happened. So there's just all the, all, like I kind of said, all the research on these rifles and features is basically based off guys submitting data sheets on rifles and saying, <laughs> you know, here's my serial number. It has these features at this time. That's why I always suggest to people not to, to mess with stuff or change out parts and do all these things. Like, cause it actually makes it more difficult. One of my big things is I've seen people add, monopods to rifles that never had a monopod they have the monopod <laughs> right. and it actually makes it more difficult because over the years it makes it look you know the imprint starts to happen on the stock from the monopod and then it looks like maybe it was there for a long time and most arsenals didn't get rid of the dust cover grooves on the receiver till the very end of the war but they never had a dust cover on them like a yeah. like boya for example by the end of the fifth series the dust cover is gone but they have dust cover grooves all the way till the 11th series so uh, people will see their the grooves there and think, oh, I gotta put one on there, and I never actually but did. But the good thing is, you can buy it then, knowing it never had a dust cover and it's being sold maybe as a little incomplete, in a way. Oh, and I've I've had rifles like that before for sure. Or you end up buying one that has a dust cover on it, and then later on you just sell the dust cover and make <laughs> make a hundred bucks. I've done that before. Too. Yep. All right. So the good thing though is. They're all marked like this for the most part. For the most part, yep, absolutely. <laughs> With the series, followed by the serial, then the manufacturer marks, and then that little inspection mark. And mine are crooked, like you said, and it makes it a little harder when they're there. You can barely see it, and it's crooked. Or it's the end of the war, and it's just really badly stamped. Like, they didn't even bother to impress it that hard. Already hard to decipher for Westerners. Oh, Absolutely. <laughs> The final inspector proof is always limp wristed. You can never make that one out. Yeah, and that's the one that throws a lot of people off. They they'll see that little mark there and have no idea what that is, but it's it's literally just a tiny, tiny little proof. It's actually most of the times that same proof is on the bottom of the uh the stock too. It's like a final stock mark too. Some of these are nice and crisp, but you could see that there was no standard for the the the, the dyes used. Yeah, and my favorite one, if you notice, know um the the Hawa, the second one down on the right hand side, they actually use an enlarged uh serial number and uh arsenal stamp. So they're they're the only arsenal that uses that font that's like that much bigger. If you it's kind of tough to see in the picture there, but if you were to compare them side to side, uh Hawa uses a it's considerably larger. Like you can actually see the series mark on them really well because right. it's 
it's almost like two times as big as like a normal uh, series mark that the rest of the arsenals used. Yeah, I never realized how different all those numbers are. Like there wasn't like a lot of standardization necessarily between each arsenal. Like obviously like the rifles themselves had a standardized style of production, like what they were supposed to do. But then the arsenal, the stamps and things they use, they're all all different. All right, so now we come to the mum here, the the beautiful Emperor's Mark. That's one of my favorite ones, Nagoya. That's a Nagoya rifle right there, and that's a nice – they have one of the Christmas mums, I think, the deepest stamped ones that really stand out. You really have to grind to get this one off. You do, and some – and then that's that leads into the stuff where you know you'll see on eBay or uh, on Gunbroker like uh you know ninety percent intact mum or eighty percent intact. It's like the bluing where they say like oh it has eighty four percent bluing. <laughs> yeah. How can you tell? The the gist of it is when it comes to a mum, it's either there or it's not. It doesn't matter if, if there's any kind of defacement to it. Uh, it's not an intact mum. And a lot of people will use like, uh, like that kind of flowery language, you know, like eighty percent intact mom or slightly struck. It's either there or it's not. You know, That's but we've all seen the mom that was like a chainsaw yep. that took it off. So they they feel the need when it's just a little X to say ah, slightly struck. And there's different. I mean, obviously, there's different styles of it. Like there's the complete grinding that you'll see. There's the struck mum, or it might just be an X through it, or like a slight chip to it. Um, and like if it comes down to it, you know, if I have three different rifles in front of me and two of them are ground and one of them is, you know, struck and all other features are the same, obviously I'm going to take the struck one over that. But when it comes down to the mums, it's either there or it's not. And so they all had the mum with the 99 type written on it, the gas hole until this stage when they just stopped writing it. Yes, and it's different. Obviously, for every arsenal, it's a little different for when they stop that. Um, so, for example, for Nagoya, it's not until uh, the seventh series that they get rid of that, and then everything else after that. Now, obviously, there's a caveat of not everything is standardized, so you'll actually run into, later in the war, they reuse older receivers sometimes. So you'll see sometimes a late war gun that has that 99 type text on it. Uh, and that's not like a fake or anything. A lot of times that is legitimate. Did many guns make it back for re-arsenaling in that short time period? So that's another thing a lot of folks, that's actually another common question I get asked, especially when people have like mismatched parts or something's kind of, you know, redone on it. They'll say, well, well, did it go to an arsenal? The fact is we don't know. Um, oh. With the 38s, they were around long enough that there are, distinctive characteristics of a re-arsenal 38. Um, obviously, they were making them from the early 1900s till you know, early 1942. So they went through considerable re-arsenal steps at times. Now, with the 99s, if you really think about it, Type 99 short rifle production did not start until 1941. Yeah, and I, I, They were in no hurry, it seemed, when they designed yeah. it in 38. Yeah, it started. It's a mean, long the, time. Yeah, I mean, it was adopted in 1939, obviously Type 99 adopted in 1939, but production of long rifles didn't start until 1940, and Type 99 short rifle production really didn't start until early 1941. So if you really think about it, the 99s were only made, the short rifles were only made from for four years. And so in terms of like a re-arsenal program, I would think they didn't. Most of those rifles, the ones that ended up, they went on a one-way trip to whatever island they went to. Yep. Yeah, and it seemed like a lot of troops didn't come back or in ex- exactly. just a short campaign, and there's this host spread out and yeah, various they, places. They went to Iwo Jima, and that was it. That's you never that none of those rifles made it back to Japan. So if there was any type of like arsenal work, it would have been done like at the unit level, you know, like a, an armor or something with a, with a worked on a rifle that maybe a part broke on. So in terms of like full on re arsenaling of type 99s, I would think that if it happened, if it happened, it was just on that small level. It wasn't something that was like done in Japan, like on a massive kind of step. And that's like good news because you, you're getting a lot of original rifles, whether they're in bad shape or not. It, exactly. They are There's, what they were. 
and it's kind of fun. I like collecting, like, with the 38s, I own uh, a decent amount that were re-arsenal, just because so many were. And some of those ones are actually the most nice-looking Type 99s, cause, or Type 38s, because uh, they were re-arsenal and just never reissued right from a factory. And they're just, like, in mint condition. But, yeah, with the 99s, I would say on the whole, there's not a, a concise effort in Japan to re-arsenal them, just because... They weren't used long enough, and there wasn't uh, enough time for them to really go through that. I was going to say, what's the most common one? But right now, what's the expensive rare one right now? So it's kind of interesting. Kind of like we talked about, like with the rope pulls and stuff. There's some late, very late war guns that are worth a lot of money, and then the early war guns are worth a ton. And it's kind of that space in between where you can still find some good deals. Uh so the early guns, the early, you know, mom, monopod, dust cover, AA sites, all that stuff, those are going for pretty crazy money. And to even find one, I haven't seen one at a gun show in years. Yeah, they're, um, they're skirting on a grand nowadays. Oh, easily, if not more. Like, I mean, I personally... And, I, but matching... What oh, about yeah, and, unmatch? Uh, not in, well, mismatching is that is that under a thousand at least? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you find a mismatched one, you can probably get that for under a thousand. But um, if it's matching dust cover matches, especially if the dust cover matches too, you don't want to buy one mismatched because anyone can throw a dust cover on a gun. Like that doesn't make it special to have the original, you know, dust cover that's supposed to be on it. That makes it special. Well, did Suppose they serial? Th- did they serialize the same amount of items all the yes, way through? But- Mostly. So some of the arsenals do change slightly. Uh, but on the most part, like for Nagoya, for example, uh, the the bolt parts, like the extractor, firing pin, safety, bolt handle, those will always match. Uh, the front band will match and the dust cover will match. As the war went on, what's kind of interesting is Nagoya, when they switched to the uh, – the welded on front band, they actually still numbered it to the gun, even though you literally can't take it off. <laughs> it's welded in place, but they still numbered it for a little while before they realized that was kind of silly. And then they stopped doing that. So for the most part, the bolt parts, all the different parts of the bolt will have serial numbers on until the end of the war. And, you know, the bolt is so easy to to take apart. You could, if they let you handle the gun, you could pop it out and take a look and see if the, and <laughs> the numbers for- match. Oh, yeah. And for people, I one of the big things I say is if you're buying an Arasaka on gun broker or from an auction or like from a, you know, somebody selling online, always ask to take the bolt part. It's like a part to see it because the most commonly mismatched parts on Arasaka are the firing pin and the safety. And in my experience, I believe that's from guys at the end of the war, basically giving their kids, because I've talked to tons of people that, you know, that were young in the fifties and sixties. And they said a lot of times they were given by their parents, you know, these old souvenir guns to play with. And they would just take out the bolt parts so that they couldn't actually, you know, use it as a gun. And so a lot of times those parts, they end up getting lost. And later on, you know, a collector comes by and just throws two different bolt parts into it and makes a complete gun. So those are the most, I would say, for a new collector that's looking to buy one, if you're buying it online, confirm, don't you say, does the bolt match? And you go, yeah, the bolt handle matches. It's, no, I need to know, does the safety and the firing pin match? And it's the last three numbers, right? Is that all yes. it is? Did yep. they ever use assembly numbers, or was that only 38s? So certain early guns, so like, uh, for example, Toyo Kogyo long rifles, they actually do match by assembly number. Same with Kokura, but it's only like the earliest, earliest guns that do that. Like the er, like for the Kokura be the twentieth series, like uh, Toyo Kogyo be the thirtieth series, and it very quickly adds. They switch to that more uh, standard matching by the serial number. Is is there any uh, you would avoid any of the last ditch, the 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 really late ones? So if you're looking for a shooter. There are certain late war guns, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on here and say that obviously there is a, in terms of the metallurgy of late war guns, there is definitely a decline in the quality of it. And actually, I had to, I pulled out from that same uh, publication, Bonsai. There's a gentleman that did um, 
a couple of years ago, he did like a, a Rockwell hardness test on a like sample, like 40 different Arasaka receivers. And the, the results showed that the late war starting in the mid war guns, the quality of the metal is definitely not as good. Not necessarily the point where obviously it's going to blow up like people say, but there is a like steep decrease in quality. And if I was shooting a late war gun, I'd be more concerned just with the bolt parts in general. Because they are, I mean, there's some rough welds on some of that stuff. So if I was going to look for a shooter, I would avoid getting a really late war gun. If only just because you risk, you know, maybe the bolt parts, like something failing on that. Not necessarily to the point where something's going to explode. But, you know, you don't want to damage a a gun that's an all-matching gun, like risk like the safety, you know, breaking or something on it, or the stock cracking or something like that from the poor wood. And you you mentioned the training rifles. I know there's a lot of 38 training rifle. Is there extensive 99 training um, rifles? There are some. Most of them are based off the 99 long because by the time like 99 short rifle production really got going, Japan really wasn't making like new training rifles as much, like just the cast iron like training rifles. So uh, there's not as many that follow literally like a tight 99 pattern where they look like that. And there's none that I can think of that look like a late war gun uh, with like the fixed sight and stuff like that. So you're never, um, I, I don't want to say never, but in general, you're probably not going to see a, a training rifle that looks like a late war gun with like the fixed sight and all that. You know, that le- leads to the Arasaka's blowing up story when they were, people would shoot those other training rifles with live yeah. ammo and oh, they're, they're going to blow up. <laughs> Almost every one of those stories is the result, and I'm sure it happens because a lot of those training rifles are not marked in any way that uh, would indicate that it's a training rifle to a to a U.S. soldier or Marine or sailor or whoever. Like it's you know they'll they'll have markings on them sometimes that say like no live ammunition or training rifle or whatever on it in Japanese, uh, and some of them do have rifling, not a lot of them but some of them do for shooting like wooden bullets and things like that. So in theory, you could look down there and say like, yeah, this looks like an Arasaka and shoot it. And I've, the craziest thing, and I saw this recently is I saw a sporterized training rifle. Oh, with, wow. <laughs> like the, the stock was cut down and I'm like, I don't know if maybe, maybe the guy started to do that and he never actually shot it or maybe he actually shot that thing and it <laughs> didn't, I don't know. Well, I thought that was crazy. I that was a few months ago. I wish I'd saved the picture of it because I'd never seen a sporterized training <laughs> rifle before. But that's where I think almost all of that myth of Japanese rifles exploding comes from. Yeah, that's probably a good amount of what keeps some Type Thirty Eight prices down too, just because people are like, "Well, uh, I don't know. I'd have to figure yeah. out if it's a training rifle or not. Uh, I'm not going to bother," kind of thing. Yeah, and it's. People, I, I mean, on Reddit and Facebook, I see all the time where the first, and that's another one of my giant pet peeves is when somebody posts a rifle, they're like, well, make sure it's not a training rifle. And you, if you know even the smallest amount of Japanese rifles, you can almost immediately tell when a rifle's not a training rifle. Uh, but people, the first thing they say is, don't shoot it. It's a tr- could be a training rifle. And like, just don't, eh, don't comment if you don't know what you're talking about. I hate, that's how misinformation gets spread. But there are some pretty obvious ways. I mean, there's no training rifle that's going to have a mum stamped on it. There's no training rifle that's going to have, like, the Type 99 or Type 38 text on it. Um, the, the Usually the only s- stuff that's going to be on it in terms of markings is just a serial number. And, and so the prices for these, it's like a uh, reverse bell curve because, right, the early ones are expensive. And as you get into the transitions, they go down a little bit. And all of a sudden, this, the last ditches and the yeah. holes... Yeah, the roll pull, some of the really rare late war, because there's a lot of weird variations and different. Some of the arsenals themselves are very small production numbers. So it it very much is like that. I think some of the mid-war guns are starting to get up there a little bit. Um, But honestly, I still see mid-war mum matching guns selling for under 500 bucks, you know, or 400 bucks. Uh, It's definitely possible to do that still while finding like an early gun for under a thousand dollars that's like you know complete and matching and all that that's yeah that's a challenge yeah that one you're not <laughs> gonna really do at any at least at any major auction or like uh 
on gun broker or anything like that. All right. So what, what do you guys recommend someone getting their first 99? Should, they shouldn't go too crazy. I think. No, I, I think the best way to do it is I think the most affordable way to get in with a, with a good quality gun is to shoot for a ground, but matching mid-war rifle that never had a dust cover that never had the AA sites. And honestly, for me, I think that's the best iteration of the Type 99 would be like maybe like a sixth series or fifth series Nagoya because it doesn't have, you know, the monopod. It doesn't have the extra stuff on it. It still has a chrome line bore. I think that's like the best iteration in terms of like just a straight up, you know, battle rifle. I think that's the way that. And, and they were first, right? Nagoya made the first. Yeah, Nagoya. So Nagoya made the first, right? They were them and, uh, Toyo Kogyo especially made the first uh, 99s. And, um, so that's good. They, it's good to have like the, the main manufacturer. Boya made the most of them. I mean, they made over a million of them uh, from uh, basically 11 complete series. And then the, the long rifles and then the, the, some of the other stuff they made, the concentric circles, the Type 2 paratroopers, stuff like that. So they made the most and they're the most common manufacturer to find. So if I were to tell somebody who was first getting into it, I would say get a ground but matching six series Nagoya. I think that's the best version of the rifle that exists. Kelly, what do you think? I forget if you think the uh, if you wait for the mum or not. So yeah, I'm not a big mum purist. I think the ground mum's kind of. I mean, it's just part of the history. It's kind of interesting that it happened and that happened on such like an industrial scale. So I'm my I have a ground mum uh, type. Let's see, it's a Series 4 Nagoya, I think. Cool, yeah. That's, when it comes to mums, so I feel like I'm uh, almost a hypocrite these days because I used to always shout, you know, that a ground mum is fine. I still stand by that, obviously. I think if you have a nice gun that's matching original finish uh, and all that's wrong with it is a ground mum, there's no reason not to buy it. But lately, I've found myself buying, especially trying to complete my Nagoyas, I found myself focusing mainly on mummed rifles, but Uh-oh. that doesn't mean I'm going to say no to a gun that's ground to. And I think one of the big things nowadays is that, especially if you're on an auction site or something like that, people just see the mum and they don't care about anything else about their rifle. Uh, my big thing I've seen lately and just from like, you know, I see what people pay for stocks on eBay. I've seen rifles that are clearly restocked in a different arsenal stock, and it's like a rebuilt rifle, and people don't care. It's just got the mum on it. Mm-hmm. So it, it's almost better for a newer collector to just not instantly get involved in, like, I need a mum gun and focus on something that you know you're not going to probably get gypped on. Well, and, and sometimes it seems like for, like, the – I guess the less desirable rifles of like transitional or like late, but like early late rifles. Like yeah. sometimes mum doesn't even command that much of a premium. Like no, maybe it's hundred bucks more. Exactly, it, it's very true. I've seen eight series gun that was like it was only listed for like four hundred fifty bucks, and it had like an intact mom and it was matching, and nobody was interested in it. And like if that was like an early gun, it'd be gone immediately at that price. But because it's like a mid, you know, mid war or late war gun, people just aren't as interested in it because it's not necessarily what they're thinking of when they think of a Type ninety nine. They're thinking of either the very early guns or those very late guns. Like I guess that's one of our like typical questions for a Type ninety nine. If if someone tells you like, "Hey, I saw Type ninety nine at a gun show or gun store," like, what do you picture in your head for that? Do you picture like early war kind of transition, maybe missing a couple of the special features or yeah, something first thing i picture whenever somebody says i saw a 99 of the guns you know store or store i think of an early gun that's ground and missing all the features on it like they were taken <laughs> off that's the most common thing you'll see for 99s is the guns like the early war guns you know like a first series or second series rifle that's got the monopod the cleaning rod the dust cover the a sights they're all missing from the gun and it's ground those were guns that stayed in Japan for the duration of the war and were never like issued. When you see a gun, like an early gun that's got all the features on it, I know I hate falling into this whole like kind of thing, but if you see a gun like that, 
there's like a 90% chance that was a gun taken from an island during the war. Was it like a common field thing or like a, I, 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 a GI was, thing? Oh, definitely not a field thing and not even a GI thing because the GI would take off like the AA sites, you know. He might throw the dust cover away, but he's not going to take the cleaning rod and all that stuff off and throw that away. I, that's the Japanese that did that. And I think they did it during the war as part of like scrap metal collections and drives like that. So when you see an early gun that's got all the features, more than likely that gun was not in Japan when the war ended. You know, you mentioned the dust cover. Um, there's the story and the rumor going around that the rattle of the dust cover gave away their position. What do you think of that? <laughs> so, what do I think of that? So, <laughs> here's the thing with that. And so they took him and threw him. Yeah, I'm sure that absolutely they did not. So, <laughs> the thing with that is, if you think about it, the Japanese put a dust cover on their rifle from the Type 35, you know, in the early 1900s onward. Like, every Type 38 had a dust cover, for the most part. Every early 99 had a dust cover. You'd think if at some point that was such a problem that, like, it was rattling so much to cause troops to be like, I need to take this off because my position's getting revealed. You'd think at some point somebody would say, hey, this is causing this many problems and guys are throwing these away. We need to stop making these. Yeah, but, true. It wouldn't, be, it wouldn't have made it to the 90, 99 at that point. Oh, yeah. It wouldn't have made <laughs> yeah. it like, because they made them like that from, you know, like the early 1900s onward, essentially, 1907 onward. They all had dust covers. And at no point did they stop and go, maybe we need to stop this because guys in the field. And they did listen to stuff. I mean, there's there's small changes in the Type 99s that happened over the course of production that they realized after field use, like, you know, stuff like, a, but they never got rid of the dust cover until they started eliminating, like, features because of the, the strain of the war. So... I mean, is it possible guys, you know, remove their dust cover on an individual <laughs> level? Possibly. I don't think they would have thrown it away. I think if they were doing some kind of, I mean, I can't even think of a scenario. Maybe well, some the action's pretty loud without the dust cover, too. So Yeah, it's the same nonsense as the, the M1 Grand ping, you know, where they <laughs> say I, the Germans would wait until they heard the ping of the, and then guys would throw empty clips on the ground to make the Germans pop up. It's it's just stuff that's spread for so long. It's become, you know, a fact almost, even though it's not. If you look at a lot of period pictures of the Japanese, and there's not a lot of type 99 pictures that exist. Uh, it's tough to find period photos of Japanese with 99s, but um, 38s especially, you'll see they all typically have dust covers on them. Yep. And I've seen, even at the end of the war, I've seen, you know, pictures of, you know, U.S. guys collecting rifles on islands or in Japan, and a lot of times they all have dust covers on them. There's a couple of mums that were wiped. Um, so did they, like, do this as they were, like, turning them in, or, like, were they, like, near the end of the war, like, all right, we're, we're screwed, just go ahead and do this real quick? So it's funny because I've seen somewhere, like, the only defacement was just, like, a tiny chip. And you almost wonder, was that, like, a Japanese, like, almost kind of like that even. Like, I've seen somewhere there's just, like, the tiniest little chip, and I'm like, was that, like, a Japanese soldier who just couldn't bring himself to, like, completely deface it or what? Like, that's, I always think that's kind of interesting, but. All he had was a, a screwdriver or something. Yeah. Or something. So, yeah, you'll, strange. See, you'll see all different kinds of it, and it just, I, again, I think it depends on where the rifle was at the time and, like, what was available. So, you know, if you're in a major city at the end of the war, uh, doing the defacement of mums. Maybe you have access to electricity and an electric grinder, and you can do that. If you're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, it's some, you know, base, like, in the middle of the country, maybe you don't have that, and you have to use, like, some other kind of defacement where you can't necessarily grind it off. So you'll see a lot of different variations of that. Um, you'll also hear the stories about the Japanese doing it in the field. Whether or not that's true, I, I don't know, because there's no... There's no real firsthand accounts of that. There's no Japanese survivors, really, you know. The, the amount of people that survived those battles, you don't have a lot of guys that say, oh, yeah, I was, I, the battle was over. I knew we were going to die. We were getting ready to do a bonsai charge, so I, I X'd out my mom on my rifle. But there's just <laughs> no, there's no firsthand accounts of that. Who knows? Like, it's it's possible the Japanese could have done that. But whether or not they did is a whole other story. And then they, they, they really cut short their uh, rods. <laughs> 
Yeah, they, I mean, literally, yeah, they, <laughs> so the early guns have um, the long style, like the A and the B there. Uh, and that's the one with the, the button underneath, right? You click the button yep. that releases it. Yep. And it literally just latches in that part kind of near the bottom of the picture there, like that little divot. Uh, and then they switch to a screw-in style, like C and D there. The big difference is like uh, kind of where like the main body meets like the, the smaller taper end. It's like slightly different depending on the arsenal. Again, tiny, tiny little thing that the average person doesn't really need to know. But there's a couple different styles. And then the rare one is that last one. Uh, where Kokura briefly switched to a push-in style bank or a uh, cleaning rod, but it's short like that. And the stock actually wasn't even drilled. It's got the push-in button, but the stock wasn't even drilled for a long cleaning rod. Um, <laughs> and pretty rare. I somehow the last two years I lucked out on two different ones of those, and I don't know how because they are. I mean, there's only a few thousand like that. So do those super short ones thread into each other, like with the German cleaning rods? No, they don't. That's the thing with those. So it's, again, there's no first-hand documentation about what the exact purpose of that was. More than likely, it's either like a stacking rod, like literally just to help, you know, like a, like a, just to be there to stack them. Or it's used like a sinker to drop like a rope down the barrel. Now, I don't reload. But I look for ammo, and I buy it, and I notice the price <laughs> is out of control. Uh, so, If you uh, could find it. I would consider myself more a collector than a shooter. I mean, obviously, I like to shoot, too. But with the night, with my Arasakas, I mean, I shoot my M1 Garand. I shoot my carbine and stuff like that. But with my Arasakas, I rarely take them out because I don't reload. And to find ammunition, especially in New York... To find a gun shop that has seven seven or six five, and especially lately, not to get into that nonsense, but especially <laughs> lately, it is incredibly impossible. So finding ammunition and the price of it is just I I have a little bit on hand that I shoot, and that's about it. And then I I, I know a couple shops around me that sometimes have it, and that's where I get it. But I definitely do not shoot my Arasakas all that much. Yeah, and if you do reload, they're they're fairly easy to make. You can make the brass out of thirty odd six. Yep, that's that's what I've always heard, and what some people I know do for sure. And um, yet, PPU makes the brass and the bullets, but they don't make live ammo, which has never made sense to me. Yeah, I. It's funny you say that because I've thought that myself too. I don't get that either. I don't know. Maybe there's a reason. I don't know how that like in terms of what they decide. Do it yourself. Yeah, I guess that's uh, it. You know. But yeah, so in terms of ammunition and shooting, I I just get I can't remember what I have on hand now off the top of my head. But I just get it from local. I got a couple of local shops that, that do get it in sometimes. And you know, I don't get it in bulk. I get like a box maybe or two boxes. Yeah, I know like Steinel, Norma and what's the other it, one? I'm pretty sure I have Norma right now is what I have on hand. PCI is a crappy one. Don't buy PCI. That one I've never, I don't think I've ever done it. I don't think. Yeah, no, I've, I know the other thing I've seen at shows around me, I'm, I'm from upstate New York, like Rochester area. I've seen, uh, there's some guys that actually sell like their own reloads, which mm, I always get <laughs> nervous with that. So I don't ever Love buy that stuff. All those pissing hot loads. Yeah, who knows? I don't know what, who did it or what they used. So I'm not going to buy someone else's reload. And compared to 6.5, what's harder to get? I think, I think, at least near me, I think the 6.5 is harder to come by. Oh, yeah, definitely. I think only, like, one or two make 6.5, where there's three or four that make 7.7. 7. Yeah, and I think overall, like, you run into more 99s. I mean, even though, like, really, they made more 38s and 99s and variations of it, I think you run into more 99s uh, at shows and, and stuff like that. So I think, and that's what most collectors want. Like, they want, like, a... In, in terms of guys who just collect, you know, aren't pattern collectors or whatever, they want a 99. They want a World War II. That's what they think of when they think of World War II. So I think that's what the market more leans towards in terms of, like, ammo and stuff like that. All right. I think we covered a lot of this Type 99, and I feel like 
I have to study about 500 more hours to, oh my. to get all the things down. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder how I got all this now. Like I sit and I'm like a few, I, if I think about it, like six or seven years ago, I knew almost nothing about Japanese rifles. And nowadays it's like, I never would have pictured myself, uh, having enough where I could basically make a website that detailed from like, just from rifles from my own collection. I never would have thought that. Now you're the expert in the field for collectors these days. I'm definitely, I, I wish I could say I was the expert. I know there's some guys that have been at this a lot longer than me that laid the, the groundwork for this. I mean, the big ones off the top of my head, um, you've got the original guy, uh, Fred Honeycutt. He's the one that wrote um, Military Rifles of Japan, which is probably the best source in terms of just covering all Japanese military rifles, like from, from where they modernized till the end of World War II. He did all this work in the 70s and the early 80s, like before anyone knew any of this, before people even knew what the series markings were. Because it's kind of crazy to think there was a time where collectors didn't know what that was. They just called it like, you know, they realized there was a funny mark before the serial number. And uh, <laughs> they would re- they'd refer to the different arsenals by like the Clover arsenal that has, you know, like they have a different arsenal logo or the Cannonball one. Uh, they, they didn't know any of this stuff. And, and Fred Honeycutt was the one that really put in a lot of that work uh, early on to do the research for that. And that and, laid the work. Are there records out of the Korean and Chinese arsenals, perhaps? So the Korean one, actually, there is almost nothing. It's funny you mentioned that. That's one of the ones where the director literally destroyed everything. There is no paperwork <laughs> to, to detail anything. And the Chinese ones in, in Mukden, the Soviets went in there at the end of the war, and I mean they just took everything. They 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 took so much machinery out of that arsenal, and I mean the Chinese were able to get it back together after the end of the uh, at, at the end of the war when the Soviets left. They did start producing from there again, but again the records are just gone. They're they're just lost to time. So finding all this information, he Fred Honeycutt actually did have a lot of sources in Japan that he that he reached out to at the time that were. Um, that were still alive, these older guys that, you know, were in arsenals. And so that's where he got some of the firsthand information on these guns. And then that laid the groundwork for guys like Frank Allen, who wrote the, the book on Type 38s, and uh, Don Voigt, who did the Type 99 book. They That that led to all that. If, if they hadn't done all that research in the 70s, we literally would know nothing about these guns. So what's the next rifle you're looking for? That's a good question. So, huh. These days, you know, the only- besides the 12th, the Goya, besides, yeah, 12th series will probably always be on my list. <laughs> the chance of me finding one anytime soon is slim to none. Um, one of the big ones I'm looking for these days is a 99 long Nagoya, um, with a mum because I've got every other series from Nagoya with a mum, uh, but I'm still missing a long rifle with a mum. And it's it's not for lack of trying, because I've seen, it's kind of funny, the Nagoya Longs are actually pretty, I say, easy to find with a mum intact, but they usually sell real quick and for pretty high money. And there's a couple recently that I wish I would have just hit the buy it now and just bought the stupid thing, because it, it ended up selling before I thought about it. So that's probably my next big one that I'm going to be on the lookout for. All right, I think we nailed it all. What do you guys think? Yep, yep. I, think, I think that's a good lot of information. It is a lot, and it's that's why when it comes down to it, the best way is to just research the basic stuff. Don't try to overload yourself on all the intricacies of the different things, and and almost kind of like you said, maybe you see a rifle you like that's in decent shape, you buy it if it's for the right price, and 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 start to learn the intricacies from there. All right, so that wraps everything up, I think. So thanks again, Conrad, for coming. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. You really opened my eyes, and now I have a lot of homework to do. A lot. <laughs> There's a lot out there, and it takes a long time, I think, for some of these things. There's just so much. I don't even know how I did it, to be honest. <laughs> Good fun. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, man, that guy knows a lot about this rifle. Jesus. Conrad was great, though, huh? Yeah, he could just rattle off facts left and right. Yeah. 
got to appreciate someone like that. You know, I, I was impressed. I was impressed with his knowledge. I was impressed with how many rifles he has. Oh, yeah. He, he is definitely one of the experts in the field. So I'm going to keep looking up my 99s and studying them because there's so much more. Oh, yeah. I'm, in, I'm inspired to seek out another one or two. They're just so many to collect. They're one of those rifles you can definitely go deep on. Well, we didn't get too deep into the current market trend, so maybe we should do a little more of that now. All right, so if I said to you right now, there's an ad up. It says, normal Type 99 short rifle for sale. What would you think it was? If it was just a normal one, I'd probably think it's either the one that comes to mind first is probably a transitional model. Those seem to be the most common on the U.S. market if it's nothing special. Because people like to highlight if it's a late war or like a super early war with all the features. So I would think it's either a transitional model missing its features or it's an early war model that all the like extra bits and doodads have been removed. So an early war without monopod, without AA sites, without the dust cover, things like that. Right. Like if there was all that stuff there, they would be mentioning it in this ad, I think. Definitely. So if I just saw like Type 99 for sale, I think I I would immediately picture none of the extra features. Probably an early war missing all that, or just a transitional model. All in right, so, general, so the transition ones I'd say are like four to five hundred bucks now, around there. Yeah, they're getting maybe up even more price. You can maybe maybe find one for four hundred. They really but, climbed in the past couple of years. With the normal folks, it's four to five, but with five to seven or five to eight with the, the the online stores. Yeah, definitely the internet premium is still a thing. Like, I don't think Legacy's ever listed anything under 850. Jeez. But if you can if you can find some old guy at a gun show that still thinks they're, they're Japanese junk, maybe that's your <laughs> ticket in for 300 bucks right there. All right, so these, the, the, the most common of these transition ones, missing a monopod and the, the probably not even a dust cover at this point and yeah, missing all her doodads, but probably the same has scrubbed. So it's worth it. It's the same exact rifle as these, but just missing a couple of things. Yeah, don't... if you're if you're just looking for, like, I want to have one rifle of every major power of World War II, there's nothing wrong with having a transitional Japanese Type 99. That fits perfectly in there. It'll shoot just fine, and you can show it off just the same as any other Japanese Type 99. All right, and you probably take a couple of days to, to, or a week or something to find one, right? Yeah, these are all over Gun Broker or yeah. uh, Guns International, whatever site you want to use for those. Or if you go to a local gun show, you might see one or two. Maybe you can get lucky, find one in a gun store or something like that. All right, so let's say the ad said normal late Type 99. How late do you think it would be if it said normal late? So the one I would think of in my head, if I pictured a late war, it's going to have... No front sight protector. It's going to have, like, the simplified handguard where it doesn't go all the way to the end. It's still going to have bayonet lug and sling swivels. It's going to have the welded-on peeper sight. going to have the simplified bolt, welded-on safety, and a wooden butt plate. That's exactly what I was thinking, and that's a, and that's a good rifle. It's the same rifle. It's so funny. It looks yep. a little uglier, but if you want a shooter, I would say... That's a a hundred to two hundred fifty dollars cheaper for a late rifle. Yeah, those. I mean, you can still find those under four hundred bucks these days, which is pretty rare for a milser, but they're they're out there because people do see them. It's like, oh, these are these are roughly made. These are these are not great, but I would. I, they still got chrome line bores. They'll still shoot just fine. I would have no problem buying one of those. I actually do want one. I I do as well, and. They're not going to be cheap much longer. I, I, everything's going up, and there's only Carcanos and these things. And, well, the Turks are always going to be cheap maybe, but. <laughs> yeah. I almost feel like I never see two the same. Oh, okay. yeah. There's there's so many variations out there. That's kind of the fun of Type 99s. Now, to me, the most common are those transition ones and then, like, a early the early late ones, I guess, if that makes sense. And a little less common is when someone says they have it all matching with the AA sites and the monopod and the mum. Yeah, that's a that's about as nice as you can get. The the thing you most often see missing is the dust cover. So you can 
find ones with a sites. You can find ones with monopods. You can find ones with both of those. They almost never see them with everything included. So those are definitely right. the ones to keep an eye out for. Like mine, for example, it is a uh, early 1943. I forget which series it is exactly, but it has the AA sites. It had a monopod. You can see where like the scratches are on the stock, but nope. No dust cover whatsoever, and it is all matching, but it has a ground bump too. But do you have the so that's dust, like your dust uh, cover channel on it? It does have the dust cover channel, so they made they still cut the channels for the dust covers. I initiated them all the way into the forty four, maybe early forty five. I would have to look that up. It's so they still really have the, late. They still have channels. Yeah, because um, it's becoming rare for people. People are showing off when they have one without the channels. Yeah, so those are that's one of the more uncommon like last ditch features to get removed because I guess it was just part of the 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 dies or machinery or something like that. So the all matching AA monopod bump is the top down. So besides that guy, everything else in between, how how, how much are are these going for now? The ones Kinda. that have AA sites monopod, maybe they're not matching. Maybe no mum. So if it if it's missing just like a feature or two or not matching, those those are we at a thousand yet? Those are, I mean, the Cadillac ones are probably touching a thousand these days. But I'd say the ones missing like one or two, like one, one thing, one or two things, that's in the five, six hundred range. They're still fairly affordable compared to some rifles like K98s. That's pretty good. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably about what I'd value mine at is around like five hundred or so. It is all matching down to like the firing pin and everything, but it's missing, missing its monopod, missing its dust cover. Got a ground mom, so yeah, probably only 500 or so. You find these ones, it takes a couple of weeks, maybe. Like, uh, I don't often see the monopod. Maybe if I look at an auction, one or two in an auction when there's seven others that don't have it. Yeah, the most common feature to have is the AA sites. And then I'd say monopod and dust yep. cover after that. And the dust cover, what stinks is a lot of them are, are, are reproductions that Look pretty good. I'm sorry, but <laughs> they somehow they they figured out those. They look like they used an old, but they yeah, have people, no serial. So people can age them. So yeah, that's one thing to look out for. To make sure there's a serial on the back of it that matches to the rifle. If I was looking right now, and I was definitely trying to get myself AA sights and a monopod, I, it might take me a month or two. I think. Yeah, you just gotta have. I mean, if you got boatloads of money, sure you can buy whatever you want <laughs> next week. But yeah, just. Just takes a little bit of patience and searching around and knowing what you're looking for. Make sure you. They also have reproduction monopods, so watch out for that. <laughs> but I don't think they have reproduction anti-aircraft sights, at least anymore. I know they used to. Oh no. But no, yeah, another thing to look out for. One thing we didn't mention uh, mention is the um, hinged floor plate. Oh, that's right. You actually yeah. hit a button and it comes flying out. I mean, that's like a step above for these rifles. Mauser didn't have that. Yeah, Mauser, you gotta like use the tip of a bullet and kind of shove it in there. It takes a lot of force and to get it to drop the floor plate. So if you have a, some sort of really bad jam or something, but nope, these just hit the button, drops out, easy to clean, easy to clear, nice feature. Yeah, I I, I recommend everyone gets one. I think I think they they're shying away from the because of the bad reputation they unwarrantedly get. But come on. Yeah, I think the reputation is finally kind of starting to go away with the newer generation of collectors. And honestly, I think Type 99 is probably one of my favorite bolt actions, period. I have quite a few, especially like World War II. I think they're, I think it's better than K98s. I think they're better than 1903s. I think they're better than anything French, for sure. <laughs> All right, so that's the gun. We talked about the bayonet before, the training bayonet. You could buy, you could find those and buy those. All day long, there must have been a lot of people training. Um, the regular bayonets, there's early and late, right, where they had the uh, quillion, the big hook quillion, and then later on they didn't have it. You know, they like everything else, they cut corners. So yeah, it kind of <laughs> follows with the transition of the rifle. So, like, early, it's the same bayonet as a Type 38, and I don't really know of a way to date them, so I can't, you can't really tell if it's a Type 38 bayonet or a Type 99 bayonet, which actually... So it's a, it's a Type 30 bayonet, so did it also fit the Type 30 rifle? Yes, that's, that's true. So they kept the same bayonet all throughout. Wow. I mean, it's hard to date the earlier ones, but the earlier ones will be 
nicely made. They'll have a big curved quillion on the bottom that's very distinct. It has a nice curve to it, so you can. <clears throat> the point of it was to be able to like hook someone else's bayonet, and you can like. I guess the myth was you could twist it and snap their bayonet or just hook it out of the way so they're trying to stab you. Well, so. and they had regular metal scabbards and all that stuff, but then didn't they <laughs> didn't they start cheaping out on that later on? So yeah, so in the kind of mid war, they still had like it was nicely made. They went to instead of that hooked quillion as they're called, they went to a straight quillion, which is like the mid war bayonet. So still nicely made bayonet, but instead of a hook, it's just a straight quillion or handguard on there still in a metal, metal scabbard and all that niceness i hope that's just e- that was ease of production and not some sort of resource i would i would think so <laughs> and then after I mean, that they kept the straight quillion they kept going you can see the pommel of the bayonets go from like rounded and machine material and everything that to just square they just didn't bother machining all that off it's just like a square pommel kind of squared off in and then, even further cost-cutting, they went from having nice metal scabbards to bamboo scabbards, which those are a little rare. It is funny funny to think about it. You're issuing something made out of bamboo. But yeah, those are a little harder to find. They're like late, late war bayonets. Still good bayonets, Amazing. but they're roughly machined. They got well, I heard they, square they were pommel. Forcing everyone, kill women, children, everyone to, to work. Oh yeah, they had. And they were so maybe they had that something a child could make a, a, a twine scabbard or something. Yeah, they were bamboo, like wrapped in twine, and I think they did something with the grips where they like weren't wood anymore. Or some other cheap, maybe they were bamboo. I don't remember exactly. And they were bamboo, but they had all kinds of cheapening out on the bayonets. But they always issued bayonets. They loved their bayonets. That's for sure. <laughs> I guess in World War One, you hear a lot of bayonet stories, but. In the other fronts, you don't hear as much as over here in the Pacific with these with the Arasakas. Certainly not. They're definitely a fan of the bayonet charge and using using them. And horrible. I mean, uh, the thought of doing it and taking it out and continuing and oof. Oof. one interesting tidbit. About... Well, if you want to buy one, <laughs> <laughs> blood blood pitting. There you go. <laughs> one interesting tidbit about the Japanese bayonets is if you buy a bayonet and a scabbard. You will almost always find a dent roughly in the middle of the scabbard, or like a, a third of the way up. And what this is, is that when the bayonet was inside the scabbard, when it was like without the dent, it would actually rattle around a little bit, make noise. So they would take the bayonet out of the scabbard, smash it with the pommel of the bayonet to make the dent, to kind of squeeze the bayonet a little bit, and then put it back in there and want to make noise in So you almost always find them with a single dent. And how many people must have been like, I don't want that one. It's got a ding in it. Oh, no, no, no. Nope, that's, Shit. that's part of history. So you almost always see that. That's awesome. And they're almost always sharpened, too, it seems like. They, they definitely liked them sharp. A lot of bayonets you'll find not sharpened, or it's less desirable if it had been sharpened by right. by Joe Bob after the war or something like that. But the Japanese bayonets, you almost always find them pretty sharp. All right, so I'd say a normal one, say, is like 100 bucks. Yeah, they're... Definitely into the hundred dollar range now. So I have I have an early war one. But Are they ever matching? Are they ever matching the the scabbard? I don't I don't recall I don't... actually. I don't know if they numbered the scabbards. I know they numbered the bayonets for a while. I don't know if they numbered the scabbards. I'm gonna have to pull mine out of the closet and take a look. I don't see it often, and I would think people would be bragging. Like when you when there's something that matches that it's good, you'll hear about it. So. Oh yeah, people are always about matching. <laughs> I think that even the training ones are getting up there, but you can still nab one. I, if you're an Arasaka guy and you're getting into them, I, I would definitely grab a training version and a regular version of everything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's where I would go. The bayonets are super cool. They have a very distinct look. You almost always see them at, like, gun shows. They're pretty easy to find on eBay. There's tons of them around. But yeah, they are in the 100 plus dollar range for bayonet and scabbard even. And there's no repros or anything of the, those, are there? I think, Fake ones? I think there are repros of those. But yeah, there, there's tons of them around. I wouldn't bother with a repro. Spend a hundred bucks, get a decent one. You'll find plenty of them with the curved bullion. And there's different kind of curves on them too. Some of them have like a nice, like perfect half circle. Some of them curve like all the way back up and touch the blade. Some of them have kind of like almost a V shape to it. There's some different weird curves to them. And I don't know if it's just them getting beat up over time or 
I think it might have been part of like their transition through the war where they just didn't care as much. And eventually they just like flipped that off, didn't, didn't bother. It, it, it seemed the Arsenals had a, a bit of freedom in some aspect. Yeah, and the, the, the bayonets Something. do have the manufacturer marks on them, just like the rifles, so you can tell who made it. And I don't think they have a series mark, or they do have a serial number on them, like the like last three letters or something, like the last three numbers. They don't have like a series, so you can't tell exactly when it was made. And there's a lot of places for parts. You can just search online, right? Every part is available. For the, all the small parts you can find, stocks, like that part, oh, that's yeah, not lo- a, a real stock, a, uh, the original sidearms or original dust covers and monopods yeah. are a little tougher. Yeah, everybody They're... everybody wanted those parts because if you find like a Sporterized Tech 99, you're just like, oh, I can just restore it, buy some parts online, easy peasy, which maybe that used to be true. These days, not so much. You're going to end up spending way more than you would just for a nicer rifle. Stocks do not exist anywhere except they come up on eBay every now and then. Same thing for like those AA sites. And... All right, so a lot of the small parts and springs and internal trigger shit, right, we could find. Yeah, you could find you can find bolts fairly easily, safeties fairly easily. Well, all right, here's the thing now. If you're looking at a photo... And it's a rifle for sale. A lot of us are buying online these days, auctions and shit. The identifying features of these rifles that I see is the gas hole on top is a big one. What do you call me? <laughs> the gas hole. <laughs> the, there's one gas hole on the Type 99, which I guess was enough because the Type 38 and the 30 have two gas holes. That's a major thing. I, I, I constantly see rifles listed wrong online and... You can see, in, even in a blurry photo, I don't know why there's blurry photos in 2022, but even in a blurry photo, you can see it's not a Type 99. Yeah, if, you, if you're, at, say, you're at a gun show or something like that, and you pick up a rifle, you're pretty sure it's Japanese, and you look at their series, you see that single big hole, you can see maybe where there was a mom, you're not sure, oh, what is this? you got to look at the writing on top of the receiver. So if it is a symbol, a symbol, and then a different symbol... You can horizontally, horizontally, key thing there. You can remember that it is on the receiver, the writing, what it is. So it is 9 9 type as they write it. So as with a type 38, which is written vertically, it is three different symbols because it is the number three, the number eight, and then the word type. For type 99, it's the same two symbols right next to each other and then a different one for type. So 9 9 type. <laughs> My buddy has a last ditch. That has no writing and no mum. Yep. So that's one thing they started leaving <laughs> off at the very end. They didn't even bother stamping it with what? It, what is this? I don't know. Get it out the door. I would say, as a quote unquote buyer's guide for this gun, if it's a last ditch, take a close look and just make sure it's not like the last week of the last ditches. Just uh, maybe they cut quarters, of, you know, while people were knocking down their door. But you do all the regular gun checks. Look down the barrel, see if it's not smooth bore. Check the, the locking lug. If there's no locking lugs on the bolt, that's a good sign something's wrong. Yeah, don't shoot that one. But I would hold out. It's still cheap enough to hold out for a beautiful one with a mum, a dust cover, AA sights. Maybe you get a monopod, but you can get all that stuff in a fairly early series. Look at the charts and get that. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, get them, get them while they're still below $1,000. God, I can't believe both action rifles are $1,000 these days for old military guns, but yeah. Get one with as many features as you can, if if that's what you want. If you just want a general shooter, maybe get one that has a mismatched bolt or something. It's not the worst thing in the world. Everyone's good. And there's, re- there's reasons it would be mismatched. Yep, just just like we had said earlier, they throw the bolts in one pile, the rifles in another. They're like, oh, hey, I want to take home a trophy. Just go grab a bolt, grab a rifle. Who cares what's what? Throw it together. 70-plus years later, here we are. No, and it's mismatch. It's worthless. No, it's still part of the story. All right. So I said I was thinking the gas holes. There's one hole in the 99. The front ears, even the late ones, don't have the ears, but the rest of the 99s have the ears. Uh, there's a, the the only two you're gonna see mostly are the 99s and the 38s. So you just gotta pretty much distinguish between the two of those. Yeah, you're probably not gonna stumble across a Type 30. Not really. 44. Maybe, maybe, maybe. It'll be maybe clear it's that 44. it's different if they say it. Yeah. Type 44 has a giant bayonet attached to it, so you'll notice that. Yeah, those are super cool. Um, The only one with the monopod and the AA sights are Type 99s. Even though there's a long rifle 
I haven't seen many long rifles that have all that stuff, but I don't even see many long rifles. Yeah, those are definitely harder to find than. And if you see a sporter, feel sad for the sporter, but like we said before, I don't know about saving the sporter. It's hard to find the stock. Maybe leave it. Yeah. If you already have a stock somehow, sure. I mean, it'll never be, obviously, it'll never be as valuable as like a full original rifle. And they do have serial numbers under the barrels in the stocks, so you can tell. But if you happen to have a stock somehow, or you have like a, say you found one in Grandpa's attic, because everyone seems to do that. You have a really rough one, and you have like a sporter receiver or something like that, barrel receiver. Yeah, you could throw it in the stock. They should fit. But don't but don't go out there trying to buy a sporter for cheap and then restore it because that's that's probably not going to happen. Everyone thinks about it. They see the gun, they see the front sights, not ch- chains, and they say, "Hmm." There we go. I have to put mine back on the wall. I have two sporters. I think I tried to save that I never saved. So just stare, stare at them. Yeah, I, I pretty much past the the golden age when you could really do that. Yes, another accessories piece is slings. So the Japanese slings were originally leather, which they found rotted really quickly out in the Pacific Islands. And then they later switched to a, it's called a rubberized canvas. So they had like a canvas that you sprayed some sort of rubber material on, and those lasted a bit longer, but they still didn't hold up that great. And sometimes you, you'll, if for like the real pristine rifles that are like actually bringbacks, like maybe paper bringbacks, or they actually got picked up in the war, full mall mall matching, all that good stuff. Sometimes you'll find a sling on them. You pretty much can't find original slings in the aftermarket. Maybe on. I'll, I'll pop up on eBay here and there. They're at least a hundred bucks when they do, and they're very fragile. You definitely can't use them to carry the rifle or anything. So you're kind of out of luck for when it comes to slings, but. They do make reproductions of both the leather and rubberized canvas ones, so if you just want to complete the look or maybe want to carry it around at your ranch or something like that, you can get a reproduction one that was thirty dollars. They look okay. Might as well have it. Yeah, those leather those old leather things, they don't really hold up. It sucks. Yeah. If you're looking to use it, definitely get a reproduction. Don't break it original slim. Now I don't know about reloading of uh the ammo, but is there any other thing that you could do, or you just have to get cases? So this one, you're kind of in luck. So there's not much commercial ammo out there. There's a few manufacturers that will say avoid PCI or precision cartridge industries or something like that. Those are not, not good ammo. You can use a brass if you want. PPU does make brass, but they don't make loaded ammo, oddly enough. For the record, I did shoot those other ones before I heard the warnings. Yeah. I've, I've sh- Myself, I've shot Excalibur. Those are good. Um, what's the other one I'm thinking of? Steinel. Steinel's good. Yeah. They're expensive, but they're good. PPU does make brass, so you can buy new brass with the head stamp of, like, 7.7. Oh, Norma also makes it, I believe. Or they just make 6.5s. One of those two. But you can buy it, or it is based off of the 8mm Mauser case. So what it also shares with that is 30-06. So you can take either 8mm Mauser or 30-06 or, say, 270 Winchester. And trim those down and convert them by running them through a reloading die and convert them into 7.7 by 58 and reload that way. Wait, that is, that's great news. Yeah, it's actually super simple. It, I've done it before. You just got to trim it and then just run it through the die make sure you use a good amount of case lubricant, and it, it's good to go. Wow. So is it harder or easier than 6.5 so, or rarer or less rare? I mean, it's easier to... I mean, you can make brass very easily. For 6.5, you pretty much have to buy it, which PPU makes it. They make a good amount. I've bought a couple of bags from them, and it, it, the rifles aren't that hard on the brass, so it lasts a good amount. Right now, the hardest thing to find is obviously primers, and the Type 99, since it's based off of the 303, it uses it doesn't use a 308 caliber. It uses like a 311 or 312 bullet, so a little bit bigger, and those are kind of hard to find right now. There's still some out there. You can find them on the graphs. Had some just the other day. Midway gets them in stock every now and then. Wow, so it's a lot more work nowadays to, to sounds like. To get yeah, so if you, find, if you find a good supply of something, stock up. And I mean, this isn't a rifle you're going to be putting a 1,000 rounds through each year unless <laughs> that's your thing. But for me, I mean, I only... I, I know I, hunters. I, I know hunters that every season it's this rifle. Yeah, I mean it, it. It's a good stout caliber. It's, I mean, 
just about equivalent to 303 8 millimeter all the cartridges of the area it'll it's a fine hunting cartridge if that's what you choose to do with it hey i got a quick trivia question for you Ooh, all right Toyo Kogio, one of the top commercial manufacturers of the Type 99 short rifle during World War II, produced their first vehicle, a tricycle truck, in 1931 that was so successful that it thrust the company to full-time vehicle production. And still, they make vehicles today under this updated name, the same that was given to their original vehicle. That is the Mazda. Correct. So my gun is made by the Mazda Corporation. That's really cool. Yep, and my, one of my bayonets was made by Toyota. Toyota something back then, but yep, the same Toyota that you think of today. That's pretty cool. I think I think they made like sewing machines back then or industrial equipment. So my first recollection with this gun was Gilligan's Island when the racist clip, I don't know if you've seen it, it's going around of the stranded Japanese soldier on the island. That's the first time I saw an Arasaka. Do you remember the first time you ever saw one? Just curious. I think mine was probably in an old Call of Duty game, like Call of Duty Pacific War or something like that. You know, I I probably did then see it in other games, but I didn't realize what it was. It wasn't, you know, until the graphics got better, every gun looked the same in this game. Yeah, it was just a wooden stick with some metal sticking out of it. But um, Letters from Iwo Jima is a good one that you could see lots of good shots of the gun. Yeah, that's probably the... The best World War II Pacific media movie or TV show. All right, boys and girls. It's time to spin the Wheel of Millsurp. All right, the Wheel of Millsurp contains a number of Millsurp dilemma prompts for us to decide on, all related to the Millsurp of the show in 99. I'll, I'll tell you the prompts here. We have Would You Rather This or That? Okay. We have buy or pass. We have make this trade. We have finish this sentence. There's a number of uh, things on here. So, all right, I'm going to spin it. It landed on would you rather? Would you rather type 99 one or type 99 two? Okay. All right. Type 99 one. Early. All the bells and whistles. Monopod. AA sites. Dust cover, mum. 1200 bucks, boom. You're going home with it. No bayonet, we're not going there. Or a Type 99 last ditch, but it is the last, last ditch serial ever recorded. But it has all the badness. It's it's no longer chrome lined. There's no mum, there's no writing. There's wooden butt plate. There's the screws are pins. It's, uh, it's the total last stage and it's 450 bucks. Hmm. The early ones are super nice and they're great shooting rifles, but I'd probably have to go with the late one. One, just because I have a hard time paying over a thousand bucks for a bolt action rifle. But also the super late one, super late ones, they're just, I just think they're really interesting with all of like the features removed and all the corners cut and just being able to like tell a story of what happened and how bad it was getting for them and everything like that. I think I'd probably have to go with the late model. Ooh. See, I like the last stitches, but I feel like there's there's a lot of them. But that early one with the mum and mm, I don't know. That's a tough one for me. Yeah, those are those are so nice. <laughs> huh. I don't know, but being the last last stitch ever, there's a little something to that. Hmm. Yeah, having the latest example would also kind of be a bonus point for it. All right, that is a bonus, huh? Maybe I do go there. Well, it doesn't matter because these two choices are never going to be offered to it. No. Uh, you will, you can get it early for that price. I, sh- I, I, I could have offered it, if I offered it lower, would it, would it entice you? It if certainly it would. would. Yeah, like, let's it... say same price, 500 bucks each. Oh, I would definitely take the early <laughs> one. Then. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, if you, maybe if you throw in like, like an original sling and some capture papers, maybe band that, that might, might bring me over. Good luck with that. Yes. <laughs> That'd be a be a diamond if you found it. All right. Well, I think we have just about covered everything for the Type 99. That was this is a pretty long starting episode, so I hope, hope you all enjoyed it. I definitely think Type 99s are probably one of my favorite mill serps out there. I really like learning about the different models and everything like that, and I really enjoy taking mine to the range, especially like 
It's a good shooter. The pretty accurate. I mean, same accuracy for any Milsurp of the day, about four and away. Recoils pretty mild. The bolt's super smooth. Trigger's pretty good. I really enjoy shooting mine. I love the sights on them. Tom, have you taken yours out much? Yeah, and I, you know, the sight picture, I hear people that don't like it and complain oh, about it. it. Oh, I love it. No, I, I like it. I, I, I like the ears on the front. I like even the cock on clothes, which I, I complain about because I'm a Mauser guy. I, I got a back Mauser. Um, you know, he, Mauser did change from, you know, cock on open to cock on close to cock on open, but whatever. Uh, it's still a very smooth rifle. The sights are great. The balance is great. I, I love it. It's one of my favorites to shoot. I wish the ammo was more available. I, I end up shooting a couple and then putting it down, sadly, and shooting <laughs> other rifles most of the time. Shoot one magazine and spend $10, 15 and yeah, it hurts. Yep. You know, I try out the stripper clips, and I'm like, all right, I'll shoot these five. Maybe I'll shoot three and hold on for a while, you know? <laughs> yeah. Ammo is definitely the limiting factor of these rifles. That's kind of probably one of the reasons they've stayed cheap cheaper compared to some stuff as well as all the myths that are mostly pretty much not true about their quality and blowing up and all that bad stuff well and 30 out six spread around the world so there's so much of the 30 out six around and it's it's sad that it's 7.7 i i've gone to shows recently and there was none not one person selling yeah we can always find eight mil or usually 303 at shows or definitely 762 like by 54 but no, you won't see much 7.7. Maybe one guy that has all the weird calories might find a box. <laughs> Maybe. I, I find more 8 by 56 r than I find 7.7s. Oh, yeah. It's sad, but it's a great rifle. I, rec- I recommend it, like, big time as a – if people getting into Millsurp, a lot of people are, are pushing the Mosins and the Carcanos because we've kind of – a lot of us started – I don't know you, if you did. I started on a Mosin. Yep, same here. Right, but this is just a tiny bit more, and I, I personally think it's better in, in oh, yeah. so many ways that I would rather start. I wish I started with this. this is, it's definitely a top tier of the bolt action rifles. So after listening to this, y'all should y'all should go out and get one. Don't but get don't drive, off though, <laughs> but don't drive up the price too much. Do your research, re listen to this episode. Hopefully, we covered everything. Hopefully, we can help y'all out with that. All right, that seems to be everything. I think we wrapped that up pretty well. Yeah, I think we touched on just about every point I can think of for Type 99s. Great rifles. All right, there's a lot to this one, so you gotta you got to soak it in. Go out, buy one, shoot it, thank us later. Yep, more to come in the future, and they might be as long as this one. They might not, just depends <laughs> on the rifle. Later. Have a good one. Thank you all for joining.